Unfortunately, I cannot join this cheerful choir that everything is great and we are so proud and excited by these products that come. I'm rather frightened by the products that come um, and by the way we react to it and basically surrender our future to what comes. <clears throat> so um, the biggest curse I've seen uh, over the years is that sometimes we are a self-celebrating crowd and the progress that we did from last year to this year is celebrated as an achievement, which is really great. Bullshit. Yeah? The biggest thing that we have is a total miscalibration of everything we do. We think we have improved, but in the grand scheme of things, we are nowhere. So I would like to do this recalibration, because unless we don't do this recalibration, we are content with tiny steps that don't matter at all. So <clears throat> I wanted to analyze um, the, the scope. Um, these uh, charts are not new, I excuse myself, but they haven't, um, they haven't uh, been less actual. So there are three phases which created wealth. Yeah, the first was cultivation, then we had industrialization and digitization. I'm doing this in this pointed way because I do think that it tot our wealth totally depends on that. So, <clears throat> and cultivation, because we were geopolitically uh, um, blessed, gave us some early rise in, in wealth. Then industrialization also, we progressed very well, and it was driven by national politics and by national, rather, European commerce, not globalization. And that led basically to us having in Europe a 66 billion trade surplus with the, um, with the US. Um, but then the horror began. Uh, uh, China did something very smart, they went protective. They, they, they protected their companies so that they had a, could rise to a level of competition which enabled them to be self-sustained and um, be a player in the world. We didn't do that. So basically, we bent over backwards, yeah, accepted everything that the US said, everything from the US was great. Yeah, there were initiatives by Google and Facebook, oh, no, <clears throat> we don't need to, we don't want to pay for the uh, publisher's content. And now we see everything is reversed, and every time we, we get um, persuaded into being calm and not being reactive as we should be. That led to a digital trade deficit. So I tried to see um, which currency could I provide to the politicians in order to, to grasp that pro pro problem in a currency that they understand. And uh, when Trump um, <clears throat> discusses that uh, it's not fair that Europe has a, a trade surplus, that may be right, but if you analyze it, and I did that together for Lexter and the Deutsche Industrie für Wirtschaftsforschung, the Institute for Wirtschaftsforschung, it's clear that in the digital field, Germany has a trade deficit of 25 billion rather than a trade surplus. So in the old industries, we still might have a surplus. In the new ones, we have a deficit, which is pretty alarming. So now let's see how can we act upon this. And we have two fields, basically, where companies get created. Um, that would be good if I can see it again. Okay, um, <clears throat> B2C and B2B. Let's start with the B2C part, which um, is basically, um, to a large extent, a lost battle, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> so when we look back in 2007, we had 350 billion market cap of all digital companies, uh, which then rose to today at a 6% penetration of consumer spend to 3.5 trillion. When you fast forward it in 20 years, assuming you have a 20% penetration in consumer spend, which seems a reasonable assumption, we end up with something like 35 trillion in market cap of these companies. What does that mean? It means, that's a good thing for, um, for founders, um, out of the 35 trillion, 1 trillion will go to early stage investors, 5 trillion will go to founders, 14 trillion go to VCs, and 15 to public markets. Um, there comes the curse. Now we see, we have in 2017, out of the 3.5 trillion, it's five companies with 500 billion, 
and it's 15 companies with 47 billion, and then you have some others which have a minor, uh, minor market cap. This will reinforce because the big will become bigger, and there are some driving forces that are very, very diff difficult to reverse. So our assumption at Lakestar is by 2037, with the 35 trillion, we will have 10 companies that each will have 2.5 trillion in market cap, 50 companies with 140 billion, and 500 with 7 billion. So the, the middle area will vanish a little bit. What is the driver to come from 3.5 trillion to 35 trillion? And that is scale and R&D. And that, these are the points when we need to focus on. And, um, uh, and it's the, on R&D, we can still do something. On scale, it's already tricky. So <clears throat> let's see here, economies of scale, and it's nation states by revenue. So Alibaba or Amazon or Apple or Alphabet do have gross revenues that are similar to a GDP of a state, meaning they come with political power and they use this political power. The other point of scale is MAUs. So <clears throat> my assumption is that unless you have 500 to 700 million plus customers, uh, you will not have scale to, to survive or to be one of the big companies in B2C in 2037. Um, <clears throat> and this is mainly driven by the future importance of artificial intelligence, which is a function of having a lot of customers and having a lot of money to buy technologies to learn from these customers. So we see here the level of companies which have um, above five, 700 million MAUs is pretty restricted. So the next thing is R&D spending. R&D spending, it's the first time that Amazon is leading that list with 16 or 17 billion in R&D spend. And the function of having a lot of customers and a lot of R&D spending will define how which products you can build, how sticky these products are, how these products embrace you. And to give you an idea on what sizes I'm talking about. So I was in, in um, uh, Hangzhou because uh, Jack Ma has invested with us and he invited us to have a little view. And <clears throat> when you look at, uh, at Alibaba, Alibaba will at Singles Day probably send out 700 million parcels a day and 93% of these parcels will arrive in 10 days. They have a technical infrastructure that will be able to process 137,000 orders a day. Um, they, because they have a payment mechanism, with so many people, they created their own Shufa score. And if you have above a, a certain Shufa score, they are so smart to put it on a political level, meaning if you are above that level, you have certain um, advantages if you travel, you don't need visa for certain states. So the scope of a pattern of thinking is so different yeah, that we need to calibrate ourselves. We cannot uh, celeb st st celebrate these little successes because they don't lead to anything. So back to R&D spending, above 10 billion a year, only one in Europe does it. And if you reassess it, this is entire R&D spending. If you go back to only digital, uh, then it is a pretty, pretty um, clear picture here. So R&D spending above five billion. We see, funny enough, we see in the combination of the people doing it already those that have a big reach and those spend a lot of R&D in tech. So it is self-reinforcing trend that we see here. Um, <clears throat> on, a, on a scale here you can see a function of reach and R&D spend. And I do think that the picture is pretty clear where the industry is heading, where the power shift will go. And I'm not sure to what extent we can, we can act on it. Yeah? But if we want to act on it, we definitely need to think in a totally different way and not, um, and not trying to, to do these tiny steps. Some additional numbers. Here, geographic split. Interesting one here is 65% of the value distribution is in the US, but the US has a global footprint. So because the 65% market cap basically constitutes itself also from companies that have their headquarters in the US but are global, and therefore 
taking the uh, margins uh, on a global level. China, with its 25% market share in value distribution, is only local so far. So meaning if they start to um, expand, this picture will shift again. Um, Europe, um, under proportion um, of, of, of value distribution. And I give you another number, which uh, for me is the most shocking number at all, and this is a clear message to the politics. Um, because we can't change this as much as we, uh, as we strive to. Uh, the biggest 30 companies are which are digital and not listed, they had raised 80 billion in funding. Um, on these rounds, G European capital took part in 16% of the financing rounds. We invested 1.9% of the money and we are represented with 1.4% in these cap tables. Yeah? So that doesn't work out. There is a total mismatch. So not only that is a good asset class and uh, insurances not investing in this asset class depriving their pensioners from a decent return for their pension, yeah, it's also that investing in this, um, in this asset class and not being, or not investing and not being on the cap table totally deprives us from influence in supervisory boards that we would have at these big companies. And it's so easy to mend. It is so easy to mend. I'm talking eight years, 60 billion. The EU spends over 100 billion a year for cows and crops. Yeah? So, I mean, we need to see uh, where our bets are for the future. And um, we, still have to we, we, we still have a chance, but we need to move heavily. And that's why I'm a little bit over um, stressing this kind of calibration thing here. Um, <clears throat> there are some industries which are lesser uh, affected and which are already pretty far in digital. Um, and that means 5 or 6% for Europe on the 35 trillion is the opportunity for the next 20 years. On the B2B side, I would like to make a split because the, the, if we focus, the picture is way better here. Um, as, as said, we do have industries with an enormous knowledge and um, there are, are companies to be built that way earlier get into regulation uh, thresholds. And if they hit regulatory thresholds, we do have all the chance to act on these regulatory thresholds to protect our industries so that they do have a fair chance on a platform neutrality, which I doubt they would have if we not act. Um, so here we see two different kind of clusters, one that are decently digitalized and ones which are not. Um, the degree of digitalization on these early movers is still pretty early. Uh, and on the others, it's hardly seeable. And the values that are still at stake are pretty high. Um, so it is on the, earlier, on, the, on the earlier movers, it's 4.3 trillion. On the low digitized, it's 5.7. So what does it mean um, here? Europe has 33% of value distribution in the B2B part. So we are still somewhere. We are still somewhere. And we do have a window of three to five years and either we act and get the money in and can invest in these companies, are in the supervisory boards, are in the driver's seats, or we get marginalized there as well. So this is the mandatory battleground for Europe. Uh, so that's where we need to act, where the, where the chances that we have, I do believe, are, are pretty good. So <clears throat> this means that there is a 33% distribution that we have in the value creation. It's a 20 trillion market, and that's the opportunity over the next 20 years. So with that, I conclude my picture and hope that calibration has sort of been able to transfer to you. Thank you very much.